Praise God. What a privilege for us to be together again, whether it's virtually, in person, through radio. Thank God for these opportunities, for multimedia, for live and in person and being able to share the good news of Jesus. Let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit, we need your help, Lord. We need your help to unfold the Word of God and to see what we could never see except without your help. Jesus put you on assignment to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us, and to give us eyes to see in the spiritual realm and hear what the voice of God is saying to us. So we receive your help, Holy Spirit, so thankfully, thankfully for your ministry in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We're talking about the kingdom way and we're on part three. This is so exciting as we get into God's way of living, God's way of being right and receiving all of the benefits of the kingdom of God. So we're going to get right back to our two big questions regarding the kingdom way. What is it? What is the kingdom way? And secondly, why is it so important to you? Basically, we've been learning that the kingdom way is God's way where there is no way. So think about this. Have you ever been in a situation where you just feel trapped, stuck, like you just can't move forward? You can't get out of the situation. God's way is that way where there is no way. So maybe your marriage is stuck and you're looking for a way where there seems to be no way. Maybe your finances, maybe your family, you're concerned about your children or your grandchildren. And you're like, I need a way where there is no way. Well, the kingdom of God, the kingdom way is God's way, that way where there seems to be no way. So yes, you should be asking right now, Pastor Stephen, what's in it for me? Oh, oh, that, that doesn't seem very spiritual, Pastor Stephen. H have you ever taken a full job? Let me ask you this. Have you ever taken a full-time job but refused the paycheck because, well, I don't want to be self-centered. I don't want it to be all about me. Well, you know, that may seem noble until you have to feed your children and maybe pay the rent, right? Have you ever gone to the doctor and had her give you medicine and you say, well, no thanks, doc. I, I don't want it to be all about me. Well, of course not. You've never done that. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and told the waitress, you know, nothing for me, but would you please just serve all these people in the dining room around me? I just want to watch that. You know, you've probably never done that. So why on earth? And before heaven, would you diminish God's character and power by thinking it's humility to step away from asking what you know you want an answer to? What in this whole kingdom way is for me? What does Jesus have for me? Why is the kingdom way so important to me? You should be asking that question. You know, the disciples, they got in a full on fight and an argument in Luke chapter 22. And this was right after communion. They just had the first communion that ever happened on earth. And guess what? The disciples, you think they get all spiritual, right? No, no. They get in a fight about, guess what? Who was going to be the greatest? They wanted to, they, they were arguing with each other. And I mean, it was a real push and pull. And Jesus, you would think he would step in and say, I cannot believe it. The audacity that you guys, I'm about to go to the cross and you guys are fighting about who was greatest. No, no. And Jesus didn't rebuke them. Here's what he said. He, did, he didn't say, how dare you guys get in a fight about this? Here is what he said. He said, you know what? Do you want to be the greatest? Let me teach you how. He said, you need to model me. You need to be a servant like me. I served you guys. If you want to be the greatest, you need to be the greatest servant. Jesus didn't. He didn't stop them. He helped them to learn how to become great in the kingdom of God. And then he went on to even say, I'm going to confer the kingdom of God on you with authority. I'm telling you, we have such upside down thinking. We try to approach the kingdom of God religiously, and it's not a religious order. Jesus came to be the king, the king of kings. So again, what is this kingdom way? we're talking about. And why did Jesus tell us to seek it first, even be beyond seeking him first, to seek his way first? And why is it so important to you? Well, let's take a little different tact and let's look at a different text, a different scripture. Romans 14, 17 says this, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace 
and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let me read that one more time and just interject a few things. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. What's eating and drinking? It's consuming. It's bringing from what is outside to the inside. It's not eating and drinking, but it's rightness. Where is righteousness? It's within you. Where is peace? It's, if it's not in you, it really doesn't matter. Where is joy? If it's not from within, it doesn't really matter, right? Now, imagine with me for a moment. You're sitting in a dining room, a five-star, beautiful, world-class dining room, but you're sitting in this dining room on the Titanic. When suddenly the report comes, the ship is sinking, the ship is going down. At that point, let me ask you this. Does the quality of your meal, does the, the quality of your steak, how well it's done, does it really matter to you? Is your food and drink, what you consume, is it really that important to you? You're facing the very real possibility of death in the next few minutes. Does your wealth in that moment really matter? Do your politics matter? Tell me this. Does your job title matter? Who does and who doesn't like you? Does that really matter? Really? Do your opinions and your preferences in this moment of time, do they really matter that much? I mean, you know, the whole you've got to have it your way. Does it really matter to you in this moment? You're about to go down in the Atlantic Ocean. You see, every system, every governmental system, every world system is really like the doomed Titanic. It's all going down. It's all going to evaporate. Like Jesus said, you can build your life on the sand or on the rock. You can build your life on what's doomed to fail or what will stand forever. Worldly systems, worldly orders tend to deal with the externals, the outward reality. And even then, they only manage those things to a certain degree. God's system, however, His kingdom way always moves from the inside to the out, not from the outside in, like consuming. You see, we're trying to, like, it's like, I want joy. If I can just get it, if I can just consume enough, I'll feel the joy, I'll feel the peace, but it doesn't work that way. God's system, God's kingdom is set up so that it works with all of his creation that he made to move from the inside to the outside. See, you can't take an apple seed and make it any more an apple seed if you take an apple tree and try to shove it into the seed. You can't justify the seed by taking what's outside and shoving it in the seed. That doesn't work. You know it doesn't work that way. You see, you can't calm the outside and think that you'll suddenly have inner peace. People do that all the time, in a way, almost trying to buy their peace. You can't do that. You still won't be able to sleep. And joy, joy is not the product of just the right event. I know Christians that chase events, chase conferences, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things. There's nothing wrong with going to a Christian event or a Christian concert, but they chase them like they're trying to chase this external that will somehow affect the internal, and it doesn't work that way. You can't get the right possessions and somehow think then you'll have joy. Joy is a gift from God's word that fills you from the inside to the outside. You become a conduit of God's joy. That's God's way of doing things, moving his rightness through you into the world. It moves, his peace moves from the inside. If you want to be a minister of peace in your family, you need to get the peace on the inside of you and move it to your children and to your spouse. It doesn't, it shouldn't work that somehow if your children are peaceful, then you will be peaceful. See, it doesn't work that way. You have parents chasing that kind of experience all the time. It doesn't work that way. It's not the king's way. So let's take a look at John 7, verse 38. This is Jesus talking, and he's making a big sermon in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, and he says, He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, from his innermost being shall flow springs and rivers of living water. Do you see that? He said, from his innermost being shall flow springs and rivers of living water. Life moves from the inside to the outside. The king's way moves from the inside of you to the outside. It's the result of being in the kingdom of God, on the kingdom's way. Stephen, that's what I want. 
I want that. Well, good. You're in the right place. You're listening to the right message. So let's move forward applying this truth practically now, right? Let's, let's get practical about this. In review, we know that the kingdom of God is God's way of doing things and being right. Now we've learned from Romans 14, 17 that the kingdom of God, that way is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Not based on the outward circumstances, but rather based on what God imparts by His word of, of promise and His Holy Spirit. See, the inner reality becoming your outer reality. You need to be in the Holy Spirit. You need to have the Holy Spirit's word, the promises on the inside of you, God's joy and peace and His goodness on the inside of you moving to the outside. Have you ever tried to take something that's, let's say, 400 degrees out of your oven without the oven mitts on. I, I hope you haven't tried to do that. I hope you haven't. That would be horrific. You put your hands in the oven gloves, right? Because it helps you do something that otherwise is just physically impossible. You cannot do it. You, you can't grab the extremely hot, yummy, delicious stuff with your hands unless your hands are first in the gloves. My friend, that's the way it's got to be for you. You have to be in Christ Jesus. You have to be in God's word. You've got to be in God's kingdom, in his way of doing things for you to receive the benefits. I can't receive the benefits in the oven unless I first get in the oven gloves. I got to be able to be protected. I got to be in the right order to receive the hot benefits. You and I need to be in the Holy Spirit. And he said to us to walk in the kingdom way. We have no righteousness of our own. I know I have no rightness of my own. I got to borrow my God's rightness. That's why he sent Jesus. I have no rightness of my own. None of us do. We have no peace of our own. We need Jesus' peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He is the author of it. The Holy Spirit ministers and helps us gain and retain Jesus' peace. You know, the world has pretend peace, but Jesus has the real thing. You notice the, the world says we need to keep the peace. Well, that's just all about compromise. Jesus comes along and says, I'm going to make peace. He said, blessed are they who make peace. You see, we can authorize, we can actually author peace in Christ Jesus. He is the Prince of Peace. We need Jesus' joy. We don't have any of our own. We need His joy. He is the source of true joy. Read John 15. Jesus is the source of true joy. And we can get so full of it that it overflows our life and flows into other people's lives. Let me read Romans 14, 17 again. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not consuming. It's not life moving this way, but rightness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Life moving this way, moving out of you, flowing through you from God's promises and Holy Spirit into the world. God wants to put a river we learn from Jesus on the inside of you, coming out of you, flowing out of you. So this is when your inner reality becomes your outer reality because you're already in that zone anyway, right? And it's not such a strange phenomenon at all. The unseen becoming the seen, right? The invisible becoming the visible. That's not strange to us living in this world right now. Scientifically, we know that's a reality. It happens all the time. The unseen beginning of a seed and an egg becoming a baby and becoming a full-grown man or woman. We've seen that. that. That's a reality that we live with generationally over and over and over. The unseen imagination of an architect becoming a blueprint and then from there becoming a building. That's not such a phenomenon. The unheard inspiration of a songwriter coming up in his heart, in her heart, and becoming a lyric and then becoming a recorded song and a major hit. That's not unheard of. The evil imagination of hate a hate-controlled heart becoming a crime, becoming a murder. Unfortunately, we see that all too often. The God-inspired compassion of somebody like Mother Teresa helping one life, then helping another life, then helping another life, and then suddenly touching millions of lives to the point where Mother Teresa, even though she's passed away from this earth, 
Her legacy is still going on, touching millions of people's lives. The unseen becoming the reality, the unseen reality, the inner reality becoming the outer reality. You see, you are made in the image of God, and that means you have this strange inherent power that your inner reality becomes your outer reality. That sounds good as long as your inner reality is born again of God. But if your inner reality is all the craziness of being in sin and being without God, you're not going to be happy with that outer reality, are you? You and I were born in sin. This is what the Bible says. And that's not a good inner reality. That means we require salvation. We need to be saved. We need to be helped. We need to be forgiven. We need to be redeemed back to that position that God intended for us through our grandparents, Adam and Eve. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's me. That's you. All of us. We all need to be saved. We need that inner reality rewritten, and that's part of being on the kingdom way and getting the benefits of the kingdom way. So what's the glory of God? It just said we've fallen, all of sin and fallen from the glory of God. Is, is that some kind of spiritual speak? No. It's God's great plan for you. It's God's great order for you. It's His dominion and authority position in His kingdom. Remember, in the kingdom of God are all the benefits of God. Moving from the inside to the outside. Just the same way an unborn baby moves from the inside to the outside. You can never receive what God has for you if you're seeking first what's on the outside. You must be able to operate according to the kingdom way to receive what God has for you. A mom was singing over her little one over and over and over, just singing the same song, same song. And her three-year-old finally said, Mom, you must really like that song. And the mom replied, uh, actually, dear, she goes, it's a stupid song and it's just stuck in my head. The little girl looked at her mom and she got up behind her. And she started running her fingers through her hair over and over and looking intently. And finally, she concluded, she says, Mom, she goes, I don't see anything stuck in your head at all. You know what? We can get good things stuck on the inside of us, but we can also get bad things stuck on the inside of us. In our mental construct, something critical somebody said to us, it can get stuck in our mental construct even when we're seven, six, eight years old. Something at a young age, some criticism, some parent telling you that, you know, you're worthless. You'll never amount to anything. It gets in your mental construct and it wars against your future against your destiny and your design. We can get good things stuck in us, but we can get bad things. The enemy of your soul works so hard to get bad things stuck on the inside of you. And we've all had it happen. But good things have to be pursued. You have to choose the good stuff. It's not automatic. In this broken world order, it's not automatic. It really is the salmon swimming upstream. So I'm not saying that your outer reality is not important, obviously, but I am saying your outer reality is steered by your inner reality. So there are three approaches here to your outer reality. You can go at it passively, ignorantly, or actively. The first one passively, the passive approach to your outer reality, it's like, it'll all work out. You know, what will be, will be. I guess it must be God's will. Eh, whatever. I'll do better starting tomorrow. Maybe we'll see what it's just this passive approach that somehow, you know, que sera, sera, it'll all work out. That's that passive approach. We'll see what happens. Then there's the ignorant approach. I, I just don't know. I, I, I can't choose. I, I can't make the decision. I don't have. It's not my fault. No one told me. If only this and if only that. Who knows what God's going to do? You know, I've heard Christians say that so many times. Well, who knows what God's going to do? You know, in the sweet by and by. That kind of, you know, I'm praying 24 7, but you know, it's in, out of ignorance. Did you know Hosea 4 6? God says, My people perish for lack of understanding for lack of knowledge. It's what they don't know, God says, is killing them. What you don't know is killing you. Look, the ignorant approach to, to your outer reality is, is not the right approach. 
But then there is the active approach. It says this, I'm changing now. You know, when Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is near, it was basically saying, change your thinking. He was saying, take the active approach. I'm changing now. I'm going to think different now. I'm going to get help. I'm going to take full responsibility for where my life's at. Well, yeah, but Jimmy, you know, your dad did that to you. But see, Jimmy can't take any moves to activating his future unless he takes responsibility for his life. You can't keep blaming people. You have to be able to articulate, here's what I want. I want this. So God, what steps should I begin taking right now? God, you direct my steps. You lead me. Father God, not my thinking. Not my, I'm not going to lean on my understanding, but in all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge you. See, that's the active approach to allowing your inner reality to fully and intentionally becoming your outer reality. Yes, it takes some seed, time, and then harvest. Seed, time, and then reality. But you need to be activated in your faith. So I know you. You're choosing the active approach to affecting your outer reality. So let me help you with this. Let's get pragmatic about intentionally having your inner reality decide your outer reality. Okay, step one, you got to make Jesus the Lord of your life, right? Jesus has to be the Lord enthroned upon your heart. That means only he sits on the throne of your heart, not you, not your opinion, not this and not that, not the outer circumstances. That means Jesus, the king, calls all the shots from the inside out in your life. All other directors, dictators, opinions and feelings are permanently off of the throne of your heart. You perceive and acknowledge that Jesus is on the throne of your life. Step one. Step two, you learn the language of God's kingdom. Faith, that's the kingdom way. That is God's way of doing things. Look, you can take direction from the king. How can you take direction from the king if you don't know his language? Shared understanding is knowing that God fully understands you, but you need to understand him. Faith, this unseen force of God, is the substance. It's the title deed to the revealed, the promise. That's what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Faith is the substance, the title deed to the revealed, to the outer reality. It's saying that faith is the inner reality that guides that outer reality. Faith is the language of God, and faith comes by hearing. So you got to speak the language of God. Step three, you work patience and then expectations. Patience, expectations. You know, you must let patience have her perfect work. That's what James 1, 4 says. Let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. You got to understand God's doing more than just even growing your outer circumstances. He's growing you. God wants to grow you. So you must exercise expectation in God because it pleases God. Isn't that what Hebrews eleven six 6 says? It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you have to work the expectation angle. And then step four, guess what? God honors you. God honors you. God the Father didn't put Jesus on the throne of your heart not to honor you. You're called to be a child of God. That's the honor of God. That's royalty. But you must be trained for the kingdom of God, for the kingdom way of living. The reward of humility and the worship of God, the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 4, is riches, honor, and life. I didn't say that. That's the Bible saying that. Stephen didn't say that. That's the word of God. The reward of humility and the worship of God is riches, honor, and life. Jesus scolded the religious leaders because they didn't want the honor that only comes from God. See, we, we think we don't want honor, but we pursue honor from men and women and from people and from systems and from positions. Jesus scolded the Pharisees for not going after the honor that only comes from God. And they were content with fake honor that comes from man. You can read that in John 5, verse 44. When God the Father says, well done, believe me, that's God honoring you, the God of the universe honoring you. Jesus said in John 12, verse 26, he said, and when we obey Jesus, Father God honors us. God honors us with answers to prayer. An answered prayer, that's an honor. 
the blessings of God, the forgiveness of God, the peace and the joy and the health that comes from God. That is the honor of God. God showing up when you worship him and his presence moving into that room. That is honor. So let me show you how this kingdom way works. Just for a second, pretend you're one of those cars in the movie Cars, right? That little kid's movie, I think, from Pixar. Just let me show you how this works really quick with the step one, two, three, four. Pretend you're one of those little cars. So here's how you do it. Step one, you make Jesus the Lord of your life. In other words, Jesus is the driver of your little car, right? Step one, Jesus is the Lord of your life. He drives. Step two, you got to respond to the language of the kingdom. That means you respond to the king's. He's not just sitting in the driver's seat, right? You can't, it just can't be token. He's actually steering that little car. Step three, patient and expectation. If you're going someplace, you got to stay steady on the road. Keep your little car going down the road and let Jesus keep driving you in the same consistent direction. A, a, a wonderful journey gentleman many years ago he's passed on but he told me Stephen he said consistency consistency is a rare gem when he first told me I thought that doesn't seem like much of a revelation but through the years I've learned that it is precious consistency patience and expectation stay on the highway of God the kingdom's way stay there because that's where the benefits are and step four God honors you. How? You get to the destination. There's some short destinations. We learn that there's some medium long destinations and there's some really long destinations, but you get to where you're going. You arrive. Yay for you. Well done, right? God has well done for you every day, but stay on the kingdom's way. The two top prayer requests that churches often get are for this financial help and healing. So let's try applying this kingdom way to these top prayer requests, right? Step one, you make Jesus the Lord of your life. So now you're under the king's influence and leading regarding your financial situation or regarding your healing need. Step one, start right there. Make Jesus the Lord of your life. Then step two, you respond to the language of the kingdom. Like you begin to think and say what Jesus says about your finances or regarding your healing. After all, communication requires communication requires alignment, doesn't it? You can't work at McDonald's and call a quarter pounder a Whopper. Can you just imagine that? Somebody working at McDonald's and suddenly saying, I got a Whopper here. Every, the whole restaurant goes quiet. Everybody's like, who, who is that? He, he's got a McDonald's uniform on, but he's talking, he's talking another kingdom's language. He's talking the Burger King language. You can't do that, right? When you're in one entity, when you're in one realm, when you're in the McDonald's kingdom, you got to talk McDonald's. You can't be talking five guys or, or Whopper talk in a McDonald's kingdom. You got to speak the language of the kingdom. You got to speak what's on the menu. God's got a menu. You've got to speak his language. I know so many Christians talking Whopper talk and talking McDonald talk in the middle of the kingdom way. They're not reading the menu. You can't be calling for a Whopper and McDonald's. 1 Peter 2, 24. Here's what's on the menu. By Jesus stripes, you have been healed. It even says it past tense. That means it's been paid for. You've got to talk the kingdom talk. Philippians 4 verse 19 says this, that my God will liberally supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You have to talk that kind of menu talk. You can't be talking the world's talk. The kingdom requires its citizens to speak the language of the kingdom. You see, that's faith. What you feel is likely very different than what you faith, but trusting in God is the kingdom way. You may be hungry when you walk into McDonald's and you place your order and they say, we got it for you, sir. Well, you don't have anything. They're saying, we got your order. We got your McDonald's prayer, so to speak, right? We got you. There's a little bit of time before you get your order. And the better the restaurant, more time. The kingdom requires its citizens to speak the language of the kingdom. You know, parents, they don't feel the love when their kid is acting like a total brat, but they, they rely on the knowing that they love that darling little child and their faith in love sees beyond the raw feelings. So they don't go by feelings, they go by the, the actual love that they know they have in their heart for that child. 
Step three, patience and expectation. You stay steady on the truth of God's kingdom way. Galatians 6, 9 says this, let us not grow weary or become discouraged in well-doing. He's saying, let's not be weary about staying on the kingdom way for at the proper time we'll reap if we do not give in. You know, at the proper time, you'll reach your destination if you, if you just keep driving, right? The kingdom of God is not a wishing well or a genie in a bottle arrangement. It's not a lottery. It's God's governance and His way of doing things. God uses the law of reciprocity. That's part of the kingdom way, the law of reciprocity. Jesus often uses parables about seeds sown and plants growing to describe the kingdom of God. When He spoke to investors, Jesus used parables about commodities. I've said it over and over. The kingdom of God is not a religious system. It truly is a kingdom government run by the king. And then step four, God the Father honors you. When God, when God forgives your sins, He honors you. When He gives His family name to you, He honors you. When God heals our bodies, our minds, and gives us peace, He's honoring us. When He restores our marriages and gives us joy and peace, when he, He's honoring us. When God provides a job and an assignment, when God gives good community relationship, when He gives us another meal to eat, God is honoring us because James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. So why do so many Christians seem to go through life without God's honor? Stuck. As I've said, there's a difference between receiving the king and then walking in the king's way, the kingdom way of doing things. Oh, Pastor Stephen, Jesus saved me from the drowning waters. I don't want to expect anything more. I'll just wander around here in the desert and I'll just be thankful. What? That, that makes no sense at all. It does not honor God who paid full price for you to be on the kingdom path, on the kingdom way. Jesus saved you from the dark waters of sin, but saved you for the kingdom way. To receive half of the gift, that doesn't make any sense. Well, if God wanted me on the kingdom way, he would have put me there. That's not even in, that's not in the menu of God's word. You have to make the order. You've got to, Jesus said, seek first. You do it. He didn't say, you know what? I'll seek first the kingdom for you. No, he said, guys, it's here. The kingdom of God is at hand. You seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus made a way for you and me where there was no way. Honor him by getting on the way. How do you do that? Pray this prayer. You start right here. Let's start with step one and two right now and get on the way. Pray this with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need all that you have for me. You are the way. Your kingdom come in my life. Forgive me of all my sins. You died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave. Take the throne of my heart. Be the Lord of all my decisions. Give me every kingdom benefit. Come on, say that one more time. Give me every kingdom benefit. In your name, Jesus. Amen. You know what? You just worked step one and step two. Your prayer is the language of faith, making Jesus the Lord of your life. Now, stay the course and read God's roadmap. Stay on the road. Stay on the highway of the King. 